Welcome to beautiful downtown Peoria, Arizona. We're 12 blocks away from the mayor's office. New location. You can't hear me? You know, modern society, in modern society, life becomes the life of the mind. We're taught from the earliest ages to learn, 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 alphabet, language, writing, literature, science, algebra, arithmetic. It's all about learning. And those with eager minds, those with active minds are best rewarded in school. And we grow up thinking, 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 thinking. And we grow alienated from our feelings, from our bodies. Matter of fact, for many people, spirituality is completely leaving the body. Robert says your body doesn't exist or it's an illusion. Pay no heed to the body. Just go inside. So we lose the body. So many types of psychotherapy focus on feeling, feeling the body, feeling emotions. Because to many of us, these things become lost in the life of the mind. Even for most people, spirituality is reading books, books by David Spiro, Ed Musica, Krishnamurti. And trying to understand what they're talking about. When they're talking about giving up talking, giving up thinking and getting into feeling. And when you can give up talking, give up focusing on everyday life and instead begin to sink into the sensations of the body and the under and the energies underneath the body sensations and the emotions on about the same level and get down into the area of pure beingness you live in a different reality But you have to give up the dependence on the mind. It was very, very difficult for me because I used to think if I give up my mind, I'm like an animal. No thinking, no understanding, no cognition. But until I did give up my mind, and ideas and lived in feelings i had no idea what spirituality was i watch you all i watch what you say, i read what you say when you email me or you speak to me almost all of you are lost in your minds what is enlightenment? Is Ed enlightened? Is Ramana enlightened? Is Osho enlightened? Was Robert enlightened? What is enlightenment? What is awakening? What is Samadhi? And instead of exploring yourself, 
by deeply feeling yourself. You get engaged in definitions and what those definitions mean in terms of your experience or Ramana's experience. And you never, ever, ever, ever get close to understanding who you are. Because understanding who you are means giving up understanding and just being and being comfortable with just being rather than understanding. A few of us here truly understand how unimportant the mind is, definitions are. What's how unimportant speaking is. And most of us are just all day talking to each other about absolute bullshit where a certain decoration should go. Should I travel next week to a certain place looking for a job? Where should I go on my vacation? Should I look for a new job? Or maybe you're looking for a new job and you're trying to figure out where to go, but it's always involvement with the mundane life. And you wonder how can I escape this boring life I live. It's hard to escape the boring life you live when all that you ever do is talk about it. You talk to your lover about it. You talk to your teacher about it. You talk to your therapist about it. You talk to your friends about it. What's the best restaurant to go to? What's the best park to spend time in? What kind of car should I get? How many children should I have? How can I possibly afford having children? How can I bring children into this world? Or else you talk about how lonely you are because you're not in relationship with anybody significant and you don't know how to get in relationship with somebody significant. You feel lonely and alienated, especially in this civilization where everybody is alienated. It's part of the nature of being in this modern world is to be out of yourself, out of your feelings, out of your depth. But those who spend a lot of time in silence, or in trying to feel themselves, where they go from visualizing, observing, and seeing, or trying to understand, into just sinking into their feelings, a whole world begins to open up. The world of sensations, the world of Kundalini, the world of Shakti, the world of emotions, the world of intuition, the world of bliss, the world of living at ease. And yet, Musica says, become involved with others. Love somebody so deeply that you forget about yourself. Well, it's a misdirection. I want you to love other people so deeply, so completely that you're totally immersed in feelings. It's the easiest way to become totally immersed in feelings is to fall heaven head over heels in love with somebody. Then you can enjoy all kinds of feelings anger, love, disappointment, hatred, loneliness, potential of loss, grief, all of these things will come to you when you're in a relationship with somebody you love deeply. To many, it'll feel like they've entered hell because the emotions are so intense. 
and the expectation is so high. First, I want you to know that the more you rest in feelings, just rest into yourself. Do body scans. Start at your feet and end at your head and explore every part of your body and how it feels and see if it's connected to other parts or you have to connect it through your mind. And then you explore your emotions. The more you explore your body, the more emotions are going to come up. <coughs> Grief, loneliness, fear. And the more you explore them and become used to it, the easier it becomes. And the emotions you encounter are more and more difficult to work with. But after you've done that for a few years, either in psychotherapy or by yourself, you enter the world of energies, circulating energies, kundalini energies, chi energies, different kinds of meridians and chakras. And you're in a whole new world of new age spirituality where you talk about awakening chakras, coordinating chakras, unifying, integrating. You talk about raising energy levels frequencies and you get into a whole new world of bullshit a whole new world of spiritual mumbo jumbo all that you really have to do is just relax into yourself but so few people can do it they need an external stimulus like somebody to love deeply and then the feelings come up automatically and you're locked into your own feelings, into your heart, into your gut. The feelings grab you. The desire for the other person grabs you, holds you by the balls, so to speak. And you're in a world of feeling. And I say, go for it. If that's what it takes to get you into feelings, go for it. Some people can use music to get into their feelings and into their sensations. Sacred music is a wonderful way. Kirtans is a wonderful way. If you ever spend any time in an ashram, a Hindu style ashram, you'll hear kirtans, bhajans all day long, playing in the background, urging you to go inside, to feel your heart to feel the notes of your own beingness. But one thing you have to learn is you have to get out of your mind and into your heart, into your gut. You have to become dumb as a rock because words, concepts, and understanding cannot touch feeling. If you are a professional feeler, you've gotten to the level where you're aware of very subtle feelings, not just emotions, but sensations in the body, the flow of energies inside, the way your diaphragm moves when you breathe, when you can become lost in sensations, you find that there's nothing stable. Right, Veselina? Everything is always changing from minute to minute. Sometimes you feel love, sometimes anger. Sometimes you can find the source of love and sometimes you can't. Sometimes you try to figure out what that means and then you realize you don't know anything. And when you feel you don't know anything, you feel stupid and you put yourself down. 
but words are rather crude. Sensations are ever changing. When you get to the level of the energies of Shakti and emotions, oh my God, the workmen are showing up. When you get to the level of sensations, can you make sure they don't come in here? We have about 30 workmen going to descend on the house. When you get to be a deep feeler, like Stevie, like Enrique, like Angela, feelings get very subtle, very changeable, and they're too subtle to be grasped by words or concepts because words and concepts are fixed and very general, very generic. Take the word chair. There are probably a billion chairs in this world of all different shapes and sizes. But you know exactly what is meant by the word chair. Whenever you see a chair, you walk into a room, you know what it is, what it's for, what its function is. But the word chair doesn't describe any particular chair. It describes a generic function. The same thing with like words like love or anger. It doesn't describe your anger in the moment or your love in the moment. And so you strive to find words that really fit what you're feeling and you can't. You can't find words that fit your feelings. Nobody really has invented these words. Maybe if you know somebody for many, many years, you have developed a common language so you know what the other means exactly. But if every word is like the word chair, it's so generic, it's so general that you really can't even use it to describe your house inside. There's a chair in the corner. There's a couch next to it. There's a cat on the couch, two humans on the couch. What comes to your mind? Does anything specific come to mind? I could be describing any two people any of a billion cats, any of a billion couches or chairs. And this is how we try to use language to talk to each other about feelings and express feelings. And it can't. To truly express feelings needs a different kind of language, like poetry or music. And even then, it's not really conveying it. It's trying to induce in the other what you're feeling. Music is meant by the composer to induce a certain kind of feeling in you. Maybe in a sense conveying what he felt, but not necessarily. A good musician knows how the music affects another, even if he's not feeling it. Just like a con man knows how to use fake emotions to convince you to invest in his scheme. Language can be used to try to express truth or it can be used to induce states of feeling or wanting or desiring or repulsion in you. Stories have double meanings. Stories can be considered to be metaphors about life, or they can be there to get you to feel a certain way. 
and thus storytellers tell these stories to make you feel elation or despair or feel sadness or jack your feelings around in a million different ways, like in movies. Ramana tells stories too, and they're there for a specific purpose, which is to have you lose interest in the world and instead turn into yourself and feel yourself. The same with Robert. Robert Adams was always talking to people who feel, felt disease, who felt alienated and isolated, who felt depressed or lonely and lost. And he said, don't pay much attention to the world. Go into yourself and find yourself. Do self-inquiry. Go deep and dive deeply into yourself. And he told stories to that effect and jokes mocking people and what they do, how they avoid being with themselves and into themselves. But concepts cannot touch the way our feelings change and morph and follow each other. It's like music. It's like talking about music by saying there's a high pitch here and there's a lower pitch there. There's two octaves lower here. <coughs> there's perseveration here. <coughs> you talk about music and you don't get the feel of the music at all. The same thing with talking about emotions or talking about the experience of Shakti. You can only convey it in a way so that people want to experience it. They want to experience Shakti because they hear it so great. They want to know whether Shakti is all powerful as some people say. Now I'm talking to you now. And why I'm talking to you is to make you understand that thinking about spirituality, <coughs> thinking about who and what you are, thinking about what Ramana said or what Robert said and what they meant, thinking about whether I'm enlightened or you're enlightened or enlightenment actually exists at all. This is a total waste of time. Only when you become dumb as a rock and can stay in that dumbness, when you're comfortable knowing that you really don't know, that the only thing you know are concepts and concepts are not the reality, only then can you really enter spirituality, the world of the spirit, not of the mind. Now, there are many ways to enter the world of spirit. One is to listen to chanting or elevating music. I even think Gregorian chants can work and certain kinds of masses. But kirtan and bhajans have the most magical feel for me. And I realized that when I first listened to Muktananda style chanting with Shankarananda back in the late 70s, it was so different from the chanting in, in Zen, a different feel altogether. And you too can listen to the feel of, of Zen chanting, for example, by Japanese or by Korean, by Chinese versus Muktananda chanting or Krishna Das, and just feel the difference. You enter a world of feeling. 
Another way is by falling desperately in love with a lover, because that captivates your entire being. And you feel this tremendous sense of love, of desire, and devotion, and surrender, which can take you almost directly to God realization in a very short period of time. Because the love you feel for another is really love of God. And the God, this, the life force that you feel in another, you sense in another. But how do I convince you to give up your mind? You spent your whole life trying to understand or control things with your mind whether it's chemistry or physics or speechifying or teaching or manual labor or being a salesman. It's all based on mind and using your mind to sell, create. But what if you gave that all up and became nothing except a feeling apparatus, feeling your body, feeling your emotions, feeling your energies, feeling your life. Now I know the life of the mind can sometimes be elating, electrifying, elating. Sometimes you can feel like you're on the top of the world. You almost understand everything. You feel like you're on the verge of enlightenment. Just one more inch and you'll be enlightened. Most people have feelings like that once in a while. They're on the verge of understanding everything, of getting everything, of being enlightened. And four hours later, it's all gone. The state of elation is gone. And you realize you don't understand shit. It was just another illusion that grabbed you for a while. But understanding the mind can do that. If you study mathematics, you have these moments time after time after time when you begin to understand a new area of mathematics, mathematical logic. Algebra, modern algebra, tensor calculus. You make discovery after discovery, and it's very electrifying. You think you're really making progress by learning more and more about how to describe abstract mathematical functions. And you begin to apply it to the principles of physics. And one day you create an H-bomb. Waha. You got an H-bomb using your mind. And then you got to find people to blow up with your H-bomb. Because what's the use of having an H-bomb if you don't use it? The mind creates an artificial reality. It's like the word chair or sofa or house. None of those words describe any particular house. And whenever you use words, you're using generic words and usually trying to convey specific feelings or specific meanings to you, to another person in that time and space. And sometimes just the context conveys the meaning because you both share the context. Other times not, like when you read a book written a hundred years ago, the author didn't know you, the situation was different. You read Dickens and it's a very different world than our world. The words have different meaning, different contexts, different mood.
now everybody communicates just for the sake of communicating. We're overwhelmed with communications on the internet all day long, talking to people, joining groups, looking at Facebook, seeing how many messages you got. It's all about communications now, all about effective communications. And really, it's all about staying out of your feelings. Do you know how to get into your feelings? Let's try something. Sit back, relax. Feel into the area of your heart. Feel your chest expand and contract with your breathing. Feel your diaphragm move as you breathe. Feel how your spine responds to the movement of your breath. What do you feel in your spine as you breathe? The upper spine, area above the diaphragm. For me, I feel a slight pain. It feels like it could be described as a pain, but when I really look at the feeling, it's not pain at all, but it's a sense of tightness. It could become pain. It means my spine isn't totally relaxed. What else do I feel? I feel my diaphragm is like a solid rubber floor under my lungs. It moves up and down into the darkness of my inner innerness. And yet it's illuminated by the light of consciousness. So in a sense, it's a paradox. My inner world is dark, but it's also got a low level of illumination from the light of consciousness, which I developed over 50 years of meditation. I can feel my spine. And now that my attention's on my spine, I can feel it relaxing. And as it relaxes, my whole body begins to relax more. Now you're paying attention to your own breathing. Can you feel your diaphragm? Can you feel your heart beating? Can you feel your diaphragm moving up and down? Can you feel the air going into your lungs? <clears throat> Can you feel the air entering your nose and follow its path to the back of your throat? down your throat into your lungs. Can you try feeling your spine now? Is it cramped? Can you feel it at all? Or are your muscles so stiff that you're not even aware of your spine because muscle tension takes your attention away from your spine? Are you spineless? Or do you have a spine? And your throat rests just above your chest. What do you feel in your throat? As I speak, I feel the muscles inside my throat moving. I feel air passing through those little muscular openings, I don't know what they're called, that for, form speech, along with my mouth movements, movements of my tongue, tension in my cheeks as I form words. 
but I ask you to go back to your heart. Do you feel any energies in your heart now? Do you feel love in your heart? Do you feel loneliness in your heart or your gut? What do you feel inside of you? Does it feel comfortable? Or does something in you feel cramped? You can do this all day and all night and all day again. The more open you are to feeling, the more easy it becomes and the more you can feel. Until after months or years, you feel energies. You feel chi. You feel the kundalini in your spine. You feel energies throughout your whole body flowing, maybe different colors, circulating around your heart area in the chest or longitudinally from your brain down to your anus, sometimes moving upwards, sometimes flowing downwards, sometimes in the middle of your being and sometimes in the spine. <laughs> And when you're doing this, you may also begin to feel feelings like loss, depression, sadness, anger, hurt. And you can explore those feelings the same way you feel your body. And this is true spirituality. This is going from the life of the body and living as an object in the world of other objects to sinking into your body sensations. You're moving from the body, the physical, the objective, into the subjective, into the spirit, the spirit who feels the body, and who has emotions separate from the body. I know science tries to tie everything you feel and experience and think into mechanisms inside of the body, neural mechanisms, endocrine mechanisms. And they think they understand, but they don't. Because the world of the spirit cannot be captured by the physical. Don't even try. They can try for a million years and they may find more and more correlations between what happens in the body and what you're feeling. But they're totally different things. The world of spirit is different from the world of the physical. You can feel the world of the physical, but you are not that physical. You're that which feels the physical. You're not your body. You are that which feels the body. And you can only discover this by repetitively feeling the body and realize you're not that body, but the feeling of the body. And once you identify with yourself as spirit, in a sense, you're free of the body or more free. And the best way to understand all of this is being in love, deeply in love, fantastically in love. A lot of people do this with Jesus as a figurehead or Kali as Ramakrishna did. He formed a, a vision of Kali and he worshiped her that way. He worshiped his own projection in a deeply devotional way, thinking only of Kali, worshiping only Kali, crying for Kali's blessing. And one when, when offered the enlightenment of the absolute, he said, 
I've tasted it. You can have it. I want to continue to love Kali, be devoted to Kali. I want my Kali. And he gave up Advaita and Buddhism and continued to be a devotee of Kali. What a point I'm trying to get to you is spirituality is entering the world of feeling and leaving the world of understanding thought, words, concepts, theories, from Advaita to Buddhism to Western philosophy, Western ethics, and just submerging yourself into your own beingness. And in order to do that, you need to become dumb as a rock, which means you don't try to understand things. You try to feel things. Now, I know there are a lot of people in here that very deeply understand this. One that understands this as much as anybody else is Angela. She knows that labels are just labels. And when you talk to your feelings to, about yourself to others, you're just assigning labels to them, hoping they'll understand, but they'll never understand perfectly because they'll affix their own meaning to the labels you give them. Sadness for me. It's probably different for sadness from VJ or Eric or Spencer. Loneliness is probably felt different by Spencer than it is by me. Deep devotion may be felt by many or very few. The desire for deep devotion may be there for many out here, or very few. I know Rolf wants it. Angela wants it. Veselina wants it. Stevie wants it. Many other out there want it. James wants it. To be devoted and surrendered to another is to be devoted and surrendered to yourself. Are there any questions? Have I confused you enough for today? Do you have any questions? Vesselini, you've always got questions and emails, but you never ask questions here. Do you feel too shy to ask questions here? Um, I don't have so many questions at Satsang while I listen to Satsang. But I always have some. I know. This whole talk today was directed at you. <laughs> and people like you who are wrestling with thinking versus feeling, understanding feelings, or just acknowledging feelings, and realizing that talking about feelings talking about your experiences really doesn't help because the experiences change so rapidly and concepts and words don't. They're rather fixed. They're generic. They're not specific. But the feelings that we feel are experiences as like ever flowing music changing from Chopin to Bach to Berlioz to Bruckner, 
and you, it's like one symphony follows the other. Each one has a different tempo, a different feeling. How can you describe that in words? Even music would hard, is hard to describe the things you feel. How do you put in music Shakti? Shakti felt in the gut. Shakti felt in the heart. Shakti felt anywhere. You'd have to develop a language of music where certain themes come to represent Shakti and others' emotions and others' love. See what I mean? But words are so poor at ex exploring this whole area. We, ha we haven't done it that much. West has only been into psychology for the last hundred years. It's only beginning to explore the feeling area. It's a feeling has been repressed because the mind has been emphasized so much. How to think your way into success. Think of all the books that were written on how to be successful, how to make money, how to flip houses, how to make a million dollars in the stock market. Does anybody have a question? Angela. Speak to us about labels. What's the whole fucking point of talking then? We, sp we speak quite often and then it's always about <laughs> what is your experience? What are you feeling? But what's the point of searching for words then is it to learn to describe it in music instead of the labels we're taught i'm always called uh quite boring because i'd rather be quiet instead of talking The thing is, that's what we do as human beings. We talk too much. We try to make sense of things, or we try to connect with each other by talking about feelings. We're saying, I love you, or I hate you. But to say, I love you, what does that mean? It means nothing. Yeah, it does. It means something, but there are probably 56,000 flavors of love. Which flavor are you talking about? Are you talking about the love like one has for an infant? The love one has for a lover? The sexual desire one has for another? What are these, all these strands that are there? In a sense, it would be better if we never opened our mouths, but what a boring world that would be and we're all in silence with each other. We like to tell stories to move others, to motivate others, to make them feel something. Tell us about labels though, Angela. Tell us about your experience of labels, labeling feelings or anything else that you experience. well it's hard to share these days because i'm so caught up in surviving in the world but um therefore it's even more difficult to really describe when I'm feeling what I'm feeling because I lost um, the abiding, the time to abide and therefore the 
the way of describing yeah without the everyday words and i told ed today that i feel so far away from this way of describing from from the feeling that to go into <laughs> um yeah to to find the 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 music of of describing the the, the the colors or the, the lightness or I'm already into trying because of the back and forth in the different kinds of worlds that the daily life world where I'm struggling so hard and the the world of totally sinking yeah it's quite unclear <laughs> isn't it i just lost speaking and why why i said before that the word love doesn't mean so much is that i noticed a long time ago already that the word love um it's also a way to manipulate to get to get something from the other it's it's a habit also but to really speak from from the heart or from the energies is maybe even yeah it's different when you realize that the world of feeling is entirely different from the language that we speak that the language we speak cannot capture the feeling and we become more comfortable with silence with each other and worshiping another in silence and just looking into each other's eyes and smiling or having another expression across our face so that after a while we can read what another person feels just by reading their face as opposed to listening to their words then we've really entered into spirituality i remember robert when he'd get a letter from somebody overseas he'd take the letter the back of the letter and he scan it with his fingers to get a feel of what the person was like by what he felt from the paper and the intent of the person. So all he talked about the world being not real, an illusion. He was very much into silence and into feeling feeling truth, feeling another person with his fingers, not through their words. He was a feeler par excellence, but not of emotions so much, but of sensations of energies. Stevie, do you have something to say? What can be said after that? Gosh, 
Well, you could say, fuck you, Ed. <laughs> you don't know shit. Rolf? Um, for me, it's exactly as you as you say. I, I listen to your recordings every day and I notice that uh, I even don't try to understand. Um, it's mere, it's, um, yes, I, I lost interest in understanding. I bought the, the book uh, from Jan Esman, you, you recommended, and uh, I only can read one or two sentences and then I, I put it away. So because I'm, there's uh, too much understanding there, right? Yes, uh, there are categories of samadhis and all that bullshit, and I'm not interested in that. And uh, so, um, and I noticed as listening to recordings that uh, um, you are kind of deconstructing my my mind. So Wonderful. you don't, add, yeah, you add no no something, so it becomes less and less, and uh, so um, yeah, it's wonderful, and the energies are. As you said, uh, um, constantly changing. So every time I sit, uh, um, it's different, and uh, yes, it's uh, it's wonderful. So um, therefore, I, I have no questions because as soon as a little question is arising, it pops, and uh, I I have no more interested in, and uh, it's. Uh, so uh, it's just, as you said, feeling, 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 and uh, yes, the energy are flowing, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less, and uh, it's quite entertaining to sit and, uh, uh, yes, it's uh, roaring or sometimes more settled, and uh, yes, it's, uh, it's wonderful. So no question at all. That's it. In a way, questions and mental problems are like farts. They absorb our attention until we fart, and then they're gone like the wind. But before that, there's a pressure there that wants to be released. Something occupies our mind. We have a bloated stomach, and then we fart, and it doesn't hurt anymore. All it does is leave a little trace for us to remember it by. So mind farts. Mind farts, yes. I hope that analogy helps people. Mark, what do you yes. have to say for yourself? Well, I, I just want to say thank you again for your teaching. And sometimes I think you're, you don't exactly teach everything. You teach about 85% of what I need. But eventually you get to the parts that are meaningful to me as well when you go on and on. So I thank you and uh, the connection to Robert and to your teachings and to uh, Nisargadatta and all the rest have been invaluable to me. And I just want to say that the, uh, the hallmark for me is the, the, the bliss that uh, permeates me. So I, I feel that there's this divine syrup that enfolds upon itself and has infinite dimension, multidimensional it has um, infinite depth. So the, when you talk about depth of feeling, there's bliss and then there's bliss. This bliss has no bottom to it. I can just keep traveling and traveling as far as I want to go. It's also beyond words. And when, you, uh, when I experience it, I, I realize this is the answer to everything that I've been seeking, that this is what has, the, the lack of which has been causing my confusion, my suffering, my alienation, every, all, the, all the bullshit. So I just want to tell everybody that for, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the rewards of awakening are so vast and so palpable that anything that you can achieve in this world with your body-mind is a, a cardboard thin, temporary uh, imitation sham, which will not give you anything long term but this will this is stable it is enduring and it is beyond this world it's from a higher dimension and it informs this dimension 
So I still enjoy my life, but it is uh, so much better that I live as this field of bliss because energy is everything. Thank you. Rosemary, do you have anything? I'm having a talking mood today. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, BJ, hi. Um, you asked a question whether you are ready. I'm. I'm already convinced about giving up my mind. I'm fully ready at any given moment, regardless of my strong desire, understanding, and practices due to my old chronic habit of daydreaming. There is residual, there is a side effect of automatic attention drifting away from my stillness so that it gets pulled away by, back to the thoughts and it's... Uh, world of thought bubbles. Um, I'm, I'm trying to put attention away from the head, like at the heart or at the scan in the body. That's an endless journey, it felt like. Do you listen to sacred music? Um, I'm not much uh, uh, the listener of uh, any of these, but other day, last week, I think, when, because your audio is so horrible, and I played mine today and last week uh, from your website, and I felt very wonderful. I felt like I should be doing it more and more. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, that's a very good reminder, and I will I will try, I will listen to the more and more sacred music. And also you mentioned today Kirtan and Bhajans. Um, I will, Bhajans are those what you have. Kirtan, I'll, I need to find out uh, right ones. I don't know what they are, where they are. I have only heard the name. Um, probably my wife knows better. Okay. The other thing you can do is use your mind and read devotional books. Read devotional books by bhakti type of people who talk about loving God or loving something else to awaken that remembrances of those feelings in you. Sure. Books on devotion. Yeah, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not a good reader and also not a good listener of uh, bhajans, uh, these things. But I only read those books um, on the spirituality. For example, Robert Adams, yours, and Nisargadatta Maharaj. Any um, yogic experiences and on that kind of books. Only because I'm very, 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 very slow reader. So I don't jump onto different books. That makes me feel bored. So I, I try to stick um, some of these exciting or, you know, put me into the mood of any devotional also. You're, you're right. I, I, I see that I don't have much devotional, though I have been thinking years and just want to get into that devotional feeling um, for years. I feel like I'm trying, but don't know what it is. It is to see to simply foot. And it's a much same, similar to love. I don't know if I hear the love, I try to feel, foot all efforts. I don't know what the love is, believe me. I try to remember my son, my daughter, my whom I love most. At there's only a sensation, but I don't know what love is. 
something like that. I, 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 I'll, I'll start reading devotional books. I don't know the names of any. I think one is in the woods of God realization. Hmm. But you can find them. Sure. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I hope next week we are not disturbed by so many different external events. Did you enjoy today's talk? Today's bullshit. I'll see you next week at the same time, same place. Practice devotion during the week. Find a love object and love her or him or it with all your heart, all your devotion. Bow to it. Bow to a cat. Watch the cat bow back to you. They're remarkable that way. Whenever I get up in the morning and walk out into the hallway, there's a cat that bows to me. They all do it. You've all seen it. How they put their paws forward and bow first thing in the morning. Bow back if you can. I love you all. Take care. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.